Hi, everybody. Oh, lovely to be here today. Um, I'm Carla. Uh, and I'm here because I believe very strongly in uh, unlocking human potential. And I also believe very strongly in unlocking organizational performance. And I think that the way to do it is to actually have organizations and leaders uh, lead with a talent-first organization. Um, so what I'm going to share with you today is uh, some of what we at McKinsey have been doing in the world around uh, thinking about talent. And I'm going to start a, you know, a while back. Um, we had a managing director, so our, our managing director recently left the firm. Um, or not, yeah, he, he sort of moved on. Uh, we have a new managing director. Um, and you know, when he joined, when he took over as managing director, though, um, over 10 or 12 years ago, uh, he had set out a very interesting mission for himself, which was that he was going to meet with two CEOs a day, every day. Um, and as you can imagine, uh, that's a big mission to live up to when you're in a global organization. Uh, so he went, you know, two to three continents in a week um, and really talked to leaders of global organizations to understand their agendas, what they were worried about, where we should be thinking about supporting and enabling their strategies. And one of the interesting things that came from that was over the course of his tenure, the nature and the tenure of the conversations shifted. So they went from conversations about what's the right strategy for our business, where should we make big bets, et cetera, et cetera, to in most recent years, how will we actually get the talent and enable the talent that we need to deliver on those strategies? Because it's no longer about the strategy itself. That will likely change within three to six months. And what we need is the actual talent that can refresh and agilely adapt to the fact that our strategy has to change. Um, and what that led us to do and what led him to do is partner with a group of folks to actually publish a book called Talent Wins. So some of what you're going to see comes from that book. Um, one of the things as we went through sort of that understanding of what's happening uh, that has come out is just what is that real pace of change? And what I really like about this chart out here, we all talk about how change is happening faster and faster. If you step back and look at it, though, um, disruption is happening a lot faster, right? If you think about a company that joined the S&P 500 in 1935, was likely to be on there for about 100 years. A company that joins the S&P 500 in 20, that joined in 2015 is likely to be on there for about 15 years. And I think folks are predicting that if you were to join the S&P 500 in 2020, your lifespan is likely to be about seven years. So uh, survival for organizations is really at risk, right? Um, organizations are facing a lot of disruption. Um, one of the things that we wanted to do is see those that are able to perform well, what is it that they're doing? Um, and we've looked at it from two lenses. The first lens is uh, capital allocation. Right? If you just think about an organization, uh, you're able to succeed and perform well if you're able to sort of put your money where you think the future is going. So rapid and dynamic capital allocation makes a big difference, sort of a 2x difference in terms of total return to shareholders. Now, our question was, what about the companies uh, who are doing the same thing with talent? If talent is the next unlock, uh, shouldn't you also be dynamically reallocating your capital? Talent is a little bit harder to get underneath, so we actually launched a survey through the McKinsey Quarterly and asked organizations and different leaders around their uh, approaches to dynamically reallocating talent. Um, and one of the things that we found is that organizations who were more likely to be really strategic and dynamic in their talent reallocation uh, were about 2.5 times more likely to be ahead of their peers in terms of their financial performance. Um, so that was pretty eye-opening, right, uh, in terms of what you can accomplish from a talent perspective. If we take those two things and then just think about where is the workplace going, and I know everybody talks about automation all the time, so I won't spend too much time on it. But the workplace is changing, and work is changing quite a bit. So if you put all of those factors together, uh, pace of change, the need to dynamically allocate talent, the fact that work is changing, and you won't always know quite how and where to allocate talent, um, there's quite a bit to do. <laughs> 
Um, and that's why we think it's such an important time for HR professionals and professionals such as yourself. Um, really with an eye towards how do you unlock uh, talent and people as a competitive advantage for an organization. With that in mind, um, I thought I'd share some of the tenets from the book Talent Wins and from what we're seeing some leading organizations do in this space. So I'll go through each one of these briefly, and then I'm going to do a little bit of a double click on two, three, and four, because they're sort of passion areas for me. Um, I'll skip over here. Perfect. So this, this first notion, um, what does it take to really unlock talent or be a talent first organization? Um, one of the key tenants that we're putting forward is that you can't have a business plan if you don't have a talent plan. Uh, sort of planning your strategy and pl you know, your strategic plan, your financial plan here, and then figuring out talent acquisition, learning strategy, et cetera, here doesn't quite make sense. You actually have to bring the two together. And one of the first ways to bring the two together is to actually get the folks who lead those different efforts having the same conversation, right? Uh, actually planning together how they're going to go after that. Um, you know, one of the, the proponents uh, of this is sort of this notion of a G3. And G3 is somewhat fluid. It could be a G4, G5. But really thinking through how frequently are you having the conversation with folks from the finance side, from the business side, and either on the learning and development or another part of HR in terms of what your strategy is and how you're going to go after it, right? Thinking as dynamically about the talent that you want to build and how you're going to invest in that talent as you might be thinking about an M&A strategy. Uh, so that's one of the first pieces. Um, the second is this notion of identifying the 2%. And this sometimes makes people uncomfortable uh, because it's a notion that says, if you really take a step back and look at how value is created in an organization, it tends to be relatively concentrated. As in, there's a small proportion of the population that creates disproportionate value. Um, some of it is role dependent and some of it is human dependent, to be fair, right? Um, and what we find is that there is a lot of impact to be captured if you can actually get pretty clear on what those critical roles are. Um, and, you know, guess what? They're usually not at the levels that folks usually spend their time, right? They're not always layers one and two and three in the organization. They tend to be roles that are buried a little bit further within. What this allows you to do, though, is be very specific on how are you going to create value, um, what role is going to create value, and then what do you need to do to make those roles successful, right? Which is a very different conversation. It tends to be pretty narrow and concentrated. That doesn't mean that other roles aren't important or won't contribute to value creation. It's just some recognition that there's a differentiation in the value at stake by role and what you might do as an organization with limited resources to support those should be differentiated as well. Um, this is one of my, my favorite slides. Um, every time we support a client and partner with an organization and thinking about this notion of what we call talent to value and that 2%, we do some sort of Pareto analysis to just take all the roles that we've identified um, and the value that has been attributed to them and actually look at where do you get that cutoff? Where do you get that cutoff in terms of number of roles that actually drive about 75 to 80% of the value? And almost regardless of context, turnaround, high growth, M&A, et cetera, um, almost regardless of industry, uh, biotech, power, you can imagine banking, et cetera, we see the same Pareto. Value is just concentrated in a few critical roles. Um, and one of the interesting things is that, um, depending on the size of the organization, that threshold might vary a little. But when you sit down to have a conversation on the development path of a $1.2 billion role, it's a very different conversation than when you sit down to have a conversation on the development path for somebody else in the organization. Right? You've really got to nail that $1.2 billion. It just shifts the conversation. Um, the other thing that we found that it does a lot is it makes people pay attention. 
Um, right? If you're having a hard time getting uh, the CEO or the CFO to sit down and talk about talent and where we're going, uh, the leadership development program that we need to have, et cetera, um, even about succession planning, when you show them that list and show them the concentration of value and they recognize what's in there and sort of who are in those roles, it really starts shifting the level of their interest in the dialogue as well. Um, the third thing that comes up frequently, um, so that's sort of that, you know, 2%, where do we create the most value? What we find is though that you also have to think about what we call talent at scale. So there's a range of critical capabilities in your organization that also enable value and enable those critical roles. Um, and increasingly, organizations are shifting from planning for FTE counts, right? How many bodies do I need to bring the door in Nashville for X role, to actually planning for skills? What skills do we need to bring in the door? And what skills do we have an excess of? Um, are we going to try to take that excess and reskill, upskill, whatever your favorite word is for the process of unlocking that potential? Um, are we going to try to release it and go out and acquire new skills? Or are we going to try to supplement in some way? It's usually actually a portfolio of those, right? It's not as clean as easy as saying we're just going to do one of those things. Most organizations have to do a few. Um, and one of the things that we find is that it's pretty hard to do. Any of you who've had conversations within your organization around the impact of automation um, or where you're going to you know, think about sort of building certain skills or what roles might be released um, have probably seen that it's not always a whole family of roles that's going to go away. It's portions of jobs that are going to be redirected. So really planning at a skill level starts to make a big difference. It's also really hard. <laughs> as I'm sure you know, right? Um, one, there's a thousand and one skill taxonomies to get underneath. Make sure that everybody's talking the same language. You hear a leader say, we need more digital skills. You know, that can mean a range of things. It can mean we need more UIX designers, we need more software programmers, et cetera. Or it could mean we need people to be digitally savvy pretty broad range, so requires a lot of focus and specificity. The other thing that tends to be very hard is just understanding what skills you have already, right? Especially within uh, some of your job roles, it's not always clear what skills are in there. So actually getting clear on uh, your skill baseline is worth the effort, we find, and is actually a place where uh, CEOs and even CFOs increasingly want to spend the time and energy. They're sort of looking, though, to us to understand how do we do that? How do we actually figure out what we need, uh, what skills we need, and how that rolls up into roles, and then what our strategy is to execute. Um, the next big one, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this one, is um, this notion that in order to do all of this, you do need some amount of data and analytics to actually make the linkage. Right, to be able to link uh, your talent strategy or talent efforts to value creation or performance um, requires some amount of uh, bringing data and analytics into that conversation. Uh, and what we find is that almost across the range of talent processes, there are interesting opportunities to actually make those connections. Um, and what I thought I would do is share with you some examples of what we're seeing organizations do in this space. Um, a little bit of a range. Um, one is uh, how do you actually get underneath the ROI of your learning efforts? I'm sure that you guys get this question relatively frequently. I know that a lot of organizations that I partner with um, ask this question and really you know, struggle through very creative approaches to get underneath. Um, how to answer it, because it's not a straightforward question. Um, uh, so one of the things that we've struggled to do is how do you actually define ROI of learning, right? Um, do you define it based on career progression, promotion, retention of individuals? Do you look at actual unit performance? You know, what's that mix of uh, measures that you could actually use? Um, this organization uh, really wanted to understand what is their ROI of investing in affinity groups, right, of actually bringing folks, 
specifically around certain genders um, and ethnicities together to create more of a community to enable them to be successful. And what we did is we basically took quite a bit of data from their learning system, from their LMS, from their HRIS files, um, and mapped out across this population um, what the impact was of being part of an affinity group and not being part of an affinity group. Um, and in terms of ROI, we looked at two things. We looked at promotion rates. So were folks who were part of um, an affinity group promoted more than others? Um, and we also looked at attrition. We didn't look at attrition across the board, though. We looked at attrition of top performers. Because frankly, we just wanted to say, listen, what you really care about is attrition of your top performers, not attrition at scale. And one of the big things for them, as you'll see here, is that um, their affinity programs actually made a difference. Right? They saw a substantial difference between the two. And that led to a very robust conversation around how to continue investing in those and making clear that the case for investment was there. Right? This wasn't a nice to have thing that they were doing just because they were kind hearted leaders in the organization. It was actually yielding returns for them. Um, I'm gonna jump over this one. Uh, the other notion that comes up a lot uh, when we think about ROI or just uh, learning and development and the use of analytics is how do you actually get underneath what matters in a role? And where would you actually spend the time um, as a learning professional or as an executive if you were thinking about investing in skills? So a lot of times we see sort of the a priori, you know, this must be what matters for a certain role. Um, one of the things that we find it very helpful to do is to actually say, well, what differentiates those that are successful? And let's actually bring a little bit of data and analytics to help us frame that case and understand. Largely because we all have a lot of implicit beliefs around what makes somebody successful in a job. Um, and that isn't you know, always the case, or there's, there's a range of ways to be successful. So this is an example from an insurance organization. As you can imagine, hunters and farmers are different roles, sales roles. The hunters go out and prospect new clients. The farmers uh, cultivate current clients. Um, and what we did with them was try to get underneath what makes a role successful. So the, you know, so some of the, this data is, is sanitized. But um, what it gives you a sense for is what we were trying to understand is how much of success in a role is intrinsic as in you need to hire the right profile to begin with, and how much of it is skills that you can actually develop. And where it is skills, what are the skills that you should care about? Where would you invest your time and energy um, if you were actually to try to build those skills? Um, and as you'll see here, for the hunters in particular, intrinsics mattered quite a bit. On the farming side, didn't really matter. There wasn't a, a range of personality and intrinsic profiles played out fine. There wasn't a particular set of traits that mattered a lot. On the skill side, what was very interesting is farmers had a whole range of skills that mattered. Right? The stronger you were on those skills, um, the more likely you were to be, to be successful. Um, on the hunters, it was a little bit more differentiated. Only a few of those skills seemed to matter. So that was pretty interesting for them. They were under, about to undertake a whole sort of revamp of their learning program, and it gave them insight in terms of where to focus that energy. Um, the other interesting thing that we did with them was actually look at all of the learning programs that they had and uh, just do some math on, uh, let's actually link folks who've attended different learning programs in different formats and look at how it's impacting their performance. Um, and one of the things that we saw is that I think on average folks took like 12 plus courses a year um, and uh, they actually had different levels of impact. Uh, the format mattered. So the, the first thing that was interesting was that the frequency never mattered. It just, it wasn't about the quantity. And you guys probably all know that intuitively, but you know, it's always good to sort of re reaffirm that. Um, the second thing was that certain delivery formats just were not optimal for them for whatever reason, right? And what we didn't know quite, was it the content in the delivery format or the delivery format itself? So they went to actually do some focus groups to get underneath that. But uh, what we did find is that for, certain, for, for the hunter role, certain types of content made a big difference. Um, and so it really you know, started to hone them in on where should they be focusing their energy. Um, and got also a lot of buy-in from the commercial leaders 
to invest the time, frankly, right? Because every time you, you tee up uh, something else that somebody should go do out of their day to day, um, their manager, their leader, et cetera, is thinking through the, what's the ROI or what's the impact for this? So this actually got a lot of buy-in for folks on the leadership side to sort of say, yep, let, let's go do it. Um, so a few takeaways, and then I'm gonna uh, open it up for, for questions. Um, one is uh, this notion on treating talent strategy like you do capital allocation or capital strategy. Um, and I think th there's a couple things in there, right? One is bringing the right fact base to the conversation um, in the sense that, you know, anytime you think about allocating capital within an organization or even personally, um, if you think about making an investment in a house, taking out a loan, whatever it might be, you tend to do some research. Um, and you tend to form an argument or a business case for why you would or you wouldn't do it. And I think the same thing happens with your talent strategy or should be happening with your talent strategy, right? Bringing that same sort of robustness and rigor and involving that broad set of stakeholders to actually have the conversation and frame the path forward. And really thinking dynamically about what you do with your talent. Um, the second thing is, really looking at how can you use analytics and digital tools to make that connection, right? And even, even you know, starting small, but really looking for how can you make that link between uh, efforts on the talent side and talent decisions that you're making to business outcomes. Uh, partly because uh, that's how you get you know, folks to stand up and pay attention. But I think more importantly, because that's how you actually secure what you need to deliver on the talent strategy over time. Right? That's how you know that you're going in the right direction. Um, and then this last piece is getting to know and understand who your 2% are um, and very staying very closely involved with them. The amount of energy um, and just uh, that goes into nurturing talent at scale is astounding, right? There's so much effort out there. Um, and it's worth eff worthwhile effort um, in the sense that all of the humans in your organizations matter. There's also a lot of value in being really specific and clear on that small subset that you actually want to differentiate around a bit because you know that the returns there will be substantial, right? And getting that, uh, that concept of you know, identifying the 2% and thinking through, um, you know, are you and other leaders in your organization actually aligned around who that 2% are. If you each sat down and wrote your list tomorrow, you know, would those lists you know, have the same folks on them? There's probably some overlap, but there might be some surprises, and it's actually worth having that conversation and sort of stacking hands on, this is the cohort that we're going to um, overinvest in and differentiate around. Um, so with that, um, I thought I would uh, pause a bit um, and get some questions, uh, reactions. I sped through a little bit, but I wanted to make sure that we had time to actually ch chat and talk, as opposed to just have me sort of throw things out at you. Hi, hey. um, I was wondering if there's any data, so when we're talking about that 2% yeah. by industry that sort of slices and dices and says if you're in you know, the technology field that then mm -hmm. it's typically these types of roles or workers that mm -hmm. contribute to that versus, I'm with TELUS International and Contact Center. Yeah. You know, for us, I mean, it's, it's very highly weighted, obviously, on our agents Just, since yeah. they're revenue generating. Um, but is there any industry data that McKinsey has around that 2%? You know, it's a, a great question. Um, we were actually, I spent some time with some of our folks who lead the practice yesterday going through what's, our, what's the current state of our knowledge base on this. Um, and, you know, we're not yet at the point where I could say, you know, in pharma it's X and X, Y, or Z. You know, in fig it's Y. Um, one of the things that tends to continue to surprise us and, and come out repeatedly is uh, how you differ, you know, co uh, revenue generators, to your point, tend to make the list. Span breakers over revenue generators tend to not make the list. So one of the things that happens frequently in, you know, on the commercial front is you have some sort of span breaker, the global strategic account manager lead or whatever it might be. Um, and then you have the you know, groups that report into them. Um, and what we find, and it varies by organization, but many times that span breaker role um, is not really creating value. 
Uh, sometimes it's managing value and deserves sort of credit for managing value. Uh, but a lot of times it's a, a group of individuals who own really strategic accounts who uh, have the value creation in them. Um, other times it's sort of at a regional or at a location level. The other thing that comes up frequently with this is uh, that uh, non-revenue generating roles, in, particularly in certain contexts, create a lot of value. So in organizations undertaking growth, um, HR is really critical. Uh, usually when, especially when there's geographic expansion or trying to acquire a new set of skills. Um, I had one client who's uh, going heavily into um, the digital space and banking and the value at stake in hiring the right folks as part of their new sort of IT department, not the old IT department, but the new technology department uh, was significant. And that all came down to, you know, will the HR leader in that part of the organization be able to assemble a talent strategy and a talent acquisition strategy fast enough? Um, in restructuring context, finance roles come up pretty quickly. Um, so more than by industry, we're finding that by context there are certain roles. Um, one of my favorites um, was uh, Yes, there's also a lot of surprises. Um, so recently we were working with an organization where one of the most critical roles, so one of those top 40 roles, was the person I think five levels down from the CEO who was implementing the ERP system. Because <laughs> they had so many plans hinging upon the ability to access data from different systems. Um, and without, like they hadn't quite realized it, right? But, um, you know, each one of their five business units was counting on it for their growth plans. The person driving automation was counting on it for their plans, right? It all came down to, it's gonna come from the ERP system. And there was one person, <laughs> you know, who was on the hook for the ERP system. So that was, you know, a shift for them too, to say, we're not just gonna focus here, we actually need to figure out, is that person the right lead for the ERP system? Uh, to do this, right, to put so much that we put all that confidence in that, that human. I don't know if that helped answer your question, yeah. but yeah, there. So um, continuing on with that thought around the 2%, yeah. are there other segments that you encourage people to focus on, like for example, um, high potentials, high performers, are they within that 2%, are they outside that 2%? I'm just interested to know yeah. how else you can segment key talent. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, one of the things that we've tended to do with the 2% is to start with the role, not necessarily with the human, um, and figure out what are the 2% of roles, right, that, that carry that value. Um, and then uh, we tend to do the sort of cross-matching to say, um, if you take your uh, high potentials or your high performers, et cetera, are they actually in those critical roles? Um, and one of the things that we find is that, you know, sometimes they are, and sometimes there's actually opportunities to move talent around. Um, in fact, I, I had one, one organization that I was partnering with, a bank, uh, actually had significant value um, in um, one of the, the new business lines that they were going to go down, um, and had one of their other business lines that was doing fine but was just not gonna grow, right? It was going to continue to generate a nice amount of cash. And they realized that they had three really high performers in the stable cash generation business line. And it was a little bit of a, oh, we're sort of wasting that talent, right? That business won't, it won't go away overnight. It's never gonna grow substantially. Um, it's a great opportunity to actually put those folks in new areas where they needed to galvanize growth. Um, the other type of role that we uh, also suggest looking at, it's a little bit broader, is critical capability pools. Um, and sometimes, you know, it's at the level of, uh, you know, the data scientist family or the, um, uh, there's a lot around the sort of uh, the, the group or the trio that does, you know, software development at that sort of critical capability level. Um, there it's more at the skill pool level than necessarily at the individual level. Um, but we find that focusing there matters quite a bit as well. Thank you for the time.